Welcome back to another Mech Deck Tech. Today we have our second upgrade guide for the Lost Caverns of Ixalan featuring Explorers of the Deep. This Merfolk Kindred deck is looking to ramp hard and fast while offering us some card selection and allowing our cheap Merfolk to grow larger over time. Before we dive on in, I noticed that most of you still aren't subscribed to the channel. Go ahead and tap the subscribe button and ring that bell to ensure that you will never miss an episode and maybe even earn yourself a little shout out in one of our future videos. This video is dedicated to Sublime412. Sublime, you rock. As always, we're swapping out 10 cards and leaving the land base untouched. We'll be leaning heavily into the explore mechanic with the deck and rewarding ourselves with those plus one plus one counters along the way. With that being said, let's take a look at what didn't make the cut. Starting off our list, we have Bygone Marvels. This is a graveyard recursion spell for 2 green mana, and if we have at least 8 permanents in our grave, it copies itself, allowing us to grab 2 permanents back to hand. We aren't really a self mill deck, so I don't think we're going to be reliably getting 2 permanents back to hand. Sure, we could dump some non-land permanents into our grave off of the explore triggers, but, you know, it's basically one of the only pieces of recursion in the deck, and I think we could find better things to do for 2 mana. Up next is Commander Sphere. In general, I don't mind Commander Sphere, but it is a 3 cost mana rock, and we have a lot of land ramp already in the deck. Taking 3 turns to pay for itself makes it a little too slow for what we're trying to do here. Following the Sphere, we have Coral Helm Commander. They start off as a 2 2 for 2 blue and can slowly level up, gaining a bit of power and flying, and eventually act as a Merfolk Lord. The double blue pips makes it slightly less appealing, and at the 2 mana mark we have stronger merfolk that already act as lords right away. Curse of Swine is up next, and it's a decent removal spell, but it's also a pretty costly one. If we had ways of cheating that cost, or rewarding ourselves for playing higher cost spells, it wouldn't be cut, but that's just not the case here. We're looking to play a lot of lower cost spells in a single turn, and not just one really big one. Kiora's Follower follows that curse and is another slow 2 cost merfolk. As a 2 for 2, for two that you could tap to untap another target permanent, they just don't have a place here. We aren't using that many tap effects in the deck, and that makes the ability rather weak. Merfolk Skydiver is another 2 cost merfolk that just isn't going to make the cut. A 1-1, one, one, possibly 2-2 two, two for 2 with flying is fine and the ability to proliferate in general is strong but I don't want to pay 5 mana to do so. It's at high cost to add more counters to onto our creatures that did Skydiver in, so they have to go. Reflections of Litjara is next, and, you know, the reason is really our creatures. Are they primarily merfolk? Yes, they are. However, many of them are legendary creatures, and copying them doesn't do us a lot of good since the copy is just going to die to the legend rule. And those that are legendary for the most part, don't really have ETB triggers that we could abuse and, like, lose the copy anyway. Up next is Ruinous Intrusion, a removal piece that passes out some counters to a creature. We still have a fair bit of removal in the deck, and I don't think that we're going to miss this piece all that much. Sage of Fables follows up that Intrusion and could be a source of card draw and allows a handful of our creatures to enter with an extra plus one plus one counter. But making our own creatures weaker to draw cards isn't on the menu for us. We have other ways to draw cards in the deck that don't require us to sacrifice power, so Sage has to go. Last up on the chopping block is Tributary Instructor, a 4 4 for 4 that allows us to draw cards when our pumped up creatures die. It's definitely not a bad effect, but it won't go off until one of our creatures die, and I'd rather not pay 4 mana to get a 4 4 who might not do anything. With those cuts out of the way, let's take a look at what we're slotting in to replace them. Topping that list is Twists and Turns slash Mycoid Maze. Twists and Turns is a nice turn one drop, though better played later on, to scry and then explore when we would normally just explore. This is going to help us ramp quickly, allowing us to transform it into a cave, which we could tap for mana, and we could dump some extra mana into it to dig for a creature, to add to what will be an impressive board state. Path of Discovery is up next and allows all of our creatures to explore the second they hit the field. Don't feel like anything else really needs to be said, we're leading into that explore mechanic and grabbing ourselves a ton of lands in the process. Garuk's Uprising followed that path and led us to victory, offering up trample to all of our creatures and some potential card draw to boot. 
Last up among our enchantments is a new sub-theme that I'm adding to the deck in the form of Can't Block This. We have Aqueous Form, which makes an enchanted creature unblockable and allows them to scry for some card selection on attack. We'll be seeing similar effects in some of the cards that come, with the added power all of our creatures get from the counters we're passing around, we'll be knocking out players left and right with some unblockable creatures. Continuing the trend of Can't Block This, we have the Whisper Silk Cloak, making a creature unblockable and giving a Trout. If we really need to target it with one of our own effects, we could of course move the cloak off and back on, but most of our abilities don't actually tend to target our individual creatures, so the shroud doesn't really get in our way. Following up our cloak, we have Ozolith, the Shattered Spire, to increase the number of counters that we're passing out when exploring. It can also pass out some counters on its own, though only at sorcery speed. Back into the camp block this mentality, we have Manifold Key, which we could use to make a creature unblockable for the turn, or just untap another artifact, though it really only goes mana positive with Soul Ring. Following our key, we have Jade Light Spelunker, who could help us to explore as many times as we could afford to pay for, and we're looking to pay a lot. If we happen to pull this off with any of our Explore Support cards, it could really result in a ton of ramp, or a ton of power, depending on the situation we find ourselves in. We've gone Spelunking, but let's go even deeper with the Deep Fathom Echo, which is going to explore at the start of every one of our combats, and could become a copy of any other creature we control until end of turn, which could lead to it being unblockable, beefing up the rest of our explore triggers, or acting as a lord for the other morfolk. Last up, the Golden Nightmare of the deck. I'm of course talking about the OG that is the Ozolith. Uh, so we're redistributing our counters as our creatures leave the battlefield. You know, it's going to work wonders with the alternate win con that comes in in the deck in the form of Simic Ascendancy. It's going to keep our boys beefed up and ready for battle. Of course, we kept this upgrade guide relatively budget-friendly, but there are some cards that you could add in that are, let's say, less budget-friendly, or just didn't quite make the cut because they weren't in my top 10 cards to add. Topping that list is Crater Hoof Behemoth. He's an 8 cost that can win us the game with the amount of power he'll add to the field, along with the trample that he tacks on to everybody. Vorinclex, Monstrous Raider, doubles up our counterproduction while cutting our opponents in half. Overwhelming Stampede is another big power plus trample boost, and it's actually relatively budget-friendly, sitting around $4. Triumph of the Hordes is a little less budget-friendly, sitting about $17. But Trample and Infect, hmm, takes the cake. Taking everyone out with poison, they didn't even know we had it. Agatha Soul Cauldron adds some graveyard hate to the deck and offers up abilities of those cards exiled to the entire board. It's sitting at 50 bucks right now, so I definitely couldn't recommend adding it to a budget build, but it could definitely be useful in here. Another budget-friendly card gets an honorable mention, Rohan's Monument. Makes our green creature spells a little cheaper, and whenever we cast a creature spell, we get to give a creature we already control plus two, plus two, and trample. It's definitely strong, but because we need to cast a creature spell on that turn to get the trample, the plus two, plus two is not negligible, but like the trample is what we would really want this card for. Uh, and we're not guaranteed to be able to always cast a creature spell, so that's why it didn't quite make the cut. Last up is Doubling Season to double our counters and, on occasion, double our tokens. Though we don't make a ton of them. Uh, but this bad boy is sitting at $38, so again, just too expensive to be considered budget. We kind of blew most of our budget, honestly, on the Ozolith. Um, which is why some of these, like, oh, this is kind of budget-friendly, like, four or five buck cards, just couldn't make the cut. But guys, that is the upgrade guide and honorable mentions were the cards that I cut that you think should have stayed. Cards that I added that you don't think belong, let me know in the comment section down below, and consider joining our Discord to sling spells, build decks, and much more. But until next time, good luck with your builds.